Right. So welcome back to the Liverpool Black Men's Group. We've been doing a series of conversations during um, what is known as Black History Month, even though we all agree that every month is Black History. But um, basically, we wanted to look at activism because we think that this is an important thing that, um, as my brothers here were saying, that uh, activism is something that was really powerful back in the day, but recently it's been kind of like going downwards and stuff. And, um, you know, but first let me introduce my brothers that I'm joining with. Um, to my left here is uh, Patrick Graham. Yep, as you said, I'm Patrick Graham, just repeating. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jay Blades. And Lawrence Wesker. So, Lawrence, I mean, the reason why I want to start with you is because uh, you uh, conduct the uh, local uh, slavery walks and everything, but just recently you decided to do um, walks that I believe you call them activism walks. Um, but if you could explain a little bit more why you feel activism is important to be a topic of discussion. Yeah, sure. I mean, coming from a city like Liverpool with such a tradition of black presence, um, I think it's really important to highlight the important acts of activism that the black community has been involved in going on for more than 100 years. Um, it's something that isn't really discussed. It's something that yeah. most people know nothing about. But yet, in the words of Paul Gilroy, our community was considered to be the most militant, most uncompromising uh, black community in the country, certainly around its progressive activism in the 70s and 80s particularly. And yet, that is a narrative because black people tend not to write their own histories that has been forgotten about in the history of the city. It's all there for people to find. It's documented in primary sources. So I thought it was important as part of the Mandela 8 uh, heritage program that I really highlight this history of activism within the community, hence the reason why over the summer I did these series of walks highlighting that. Yeah, and like, um, you know, Sorry. Yeah, and like Patrick, uh, I went. I attended one of these walks, and uh, you and uh, your brother Arrow were like uh, attending the walks, and you also participated around activism and you know um, speaking about what you thought was important. So, what were you kind of like joined the walk? What was it that your focus was focusing on? It, my focus was on um, the Liverpool Lake Law Centre, which unfortunately no longer there and the Merseyside Immigration Advice Unit, as well as being present when the um, William Huskisson statue yeah. was was, um, was taken off its plinth in 1982. So for me, just as, as a round, as, you know, just to say why I think activism is important for you know, the black community especially, um, activism is important for any community who is being oppressed yeah. by a system. Um, systematically oppressed where things and um, institutions are put in place or or the way they're designed to hold you down, hold you back, you know, mm. to deny your proper education, to deny your um, proper housing, to deny your proper business opportunities, all these different things that are going on um, together, then people have to be active in order to challenge them things. If people want equality and rights, then the person who was pulling them oppressive regimes is not going to give you that. So yeah. You have to demand that through activism on, on the various levels that that takes. Now, I remember <coughs> reading um, Louis Julian's book, uh, Pure Pressure, uh, where he talked about the plinth and the Hutchinson statue. But for the audience who may not know who <laughs> William Hutchinson is and, and about that moment, because a lot of people get it twisted. Like some people say that the statue was pulled down during the right. Some people say it was pulled down at a different time um, and everything and, and everything. So if you could just educate us a little bit, Lawrence, about, about that, um, what happened with that statue, because it's a part of what they're doing now, I believe what, you know, even with the redressing of statues. So if you could tell us about that, Lawrence. Well, William, Husk William Huskisson was a, uh, an MP for Liverpool from 1823 until he died in 1830. And during his time in Liverpool, this was at the, the height of the debates about the abolition of slavery. And he actually supported the merchants who were based in the city, who owned plantations in the Caribbean and elsewhere that had enslaved people on them. He spoke out in Parliament. He did whatever he could to ensure that slavery wasn't en it didn't end for the benefit of those individuals. And he was lauded in the city. Eventually, after he died at the opening of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, uh, a statue was erected to his memory. Um, and that was the statue that was torn down um, after the riots. 
Uh, it was actually in 1983. Mm. Uh, the, a newspaper report um, highlights that quite clearly. Um, and this is one of the things that I guess a lot of people don't really understand, is that that was a, a real act of um, activism within our community that was not planned. It was it was real, true, truly a case of people just saying, no, we want this taken down and we want it taken down now. And so what did they, they do? They organised as a group of people and enacted what they wanted to see happen. That was very much a tradition of our community in those days. And it's something that I personally feel we must go back to. It doesn't necessarily mean this, you know, dismantling statues and pulling down things like but it, uh, pulling things down, but it means building things up, in my opinion. And it, you know, it's organisations like what Patrick referred to, the law centre. Why don't we have the law centre anymore? Why is it up to other people to ensure that we have those types of services? You know, even if the law centre had to change the way it worked because it was funded from the government, if organ if we'd been organised as a community, we could have accommodated that. But because we weren't, you know, it disappeared. And that's a very that's one that for me is is really sad because that was a beacon within the community. That's where people did get politicised. That's where people did get educated on the importance of engaging with your community. And once it was lost, that next generation never got it. You know, some of those issues were did not come from the outside because, as Patrick rightly points out again, don't expect people who you know don't have your best interest for in you to provide for you. It seems bizarre, doesn't it, if you highlight on one hand that these people have got issues with you as a people, whether that's racism, whether it's transphobia, uh, uh, homophobia or whatever. Why would you go, then go to them and expect them to do things for you? Yeah. That's a, it's almost like, you, you, as, as Malcolm X would say, was you're begging your enemy. You know, for your freedom. No, you have to take it, don't you? It's exactly the same with our organisations. If we're not going to support our own organisations, why would you expect other people who don't have your best interests to do so? And yeah. I think that's where that's kind of where we lost out in the transition over the generations. Those earlier generations who were around and, and engaging in activism in the in the early twentieth century, they were very much of the do for self type of attitude. Don't be begging anyone to give you stuff. And then sadly, as we got up to the 80s and 90s, we ended up becoming dependent on grants. You know, grants from people who you're saying don't have your best interests at heart. Why would you go to the council to provide the service when on the same hand you're saying the council's racist? That's where I think we need to get back to that very early types of activism where you didn't beg people to do things for you. You went out and did them for yourself. That means being willing to put your hand in your pocket, to be willing to sacrifice your time and your energy to ensure that you and your children and your community more broadly have the things that they, that's, that's necessary for them to prosper. You know, Patrick pointed out a number of good points. One of the things he said is, you know, housing. Why are you going to people other than yourself to provide that for you? You know, go back to the old style of ways and doing partner schemes that allowed you to be able to purchase things, you know, as a group collectively. And then you can do for self and be in a position of power. And when people come along, they can't just move you out like they've done in our community. Our community is now struggling with gentrification because no one owned the house where, where they lived in. Mm. So they come along, they run down your house over, over a number of years and then say, okay, we've got to demolish the house, you have to move out. And then when they, when they move you out, they, they demolish your property or don't even demolish it in some cases, do it up and then sell it or rent it to a different group of people, then you turn around crying about it. You know, when you could have been buying, you could have bought that house yourself. It's, yeah. that type of, it's that type of mentality that we've got to get back to. Stop yeah. blaming your enemy for your own dis dis for uh, misfortune. You've got to do something to change the condition that you're in. Yeah. So let's talk about the, uh, um, the law center because this was a powerful um, place. Uh, it was the Charles Wooten law center, wasn't it? And I mean, you know, Brothers like yourselves, you know, I won't say what your ages are. But uh, in my experience, I've been here in Liverpool for 20 years, and most people have went through the law center, you know, like people like James Class and, you know, um, different people have experienced, like, what was going on there because it was a positive beacon for education as well as for advancing yourselves. What do you think about the, uh, what was the uh, remit of the law center and the kind of people that came out of the law center that led to this activism because that's when I believe you said that activism was really strong at that point. Yeah, well, the Law Centre and Charles Wotton were two separate organisations at that time. Charles Wotton was the Affair uh, Education College, mm -hmm. local community um, base, which that did provide a lot of knowledge base because there was black history courses there. It was um, um, educating black people who had been failed by the education system on, you know, for, on various levels. You know, obviously, you know, not just black education, but on, you know, maths. Well, we English, don't have that nowadays and, and anyway. That type of thing. So um, they were getting qualified in there and it was preparing them 
um, like access courses, so preparing them to be able to then go on to university and so on because they didn't leave the school with the relevant qualifications that to allow them entry to university. The law centre, you know, given its name, was there, you know, dealing with legal issues on housing, employment, and um, race discrimination. And so, so I apologise, they were so two different places? Yeah, yeah, two completely different okay, places. Okay, I apologise about that. that that's just my Americanness you know, there, so I just want to make it clear that I apologise that they're not the same place. Sorry. Okay, yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll just make sure I'll, I'll point that out no, thank for, you. for the audience and, and yourself. And, and um, as, as Lawrence mentioned before, you know, the law centre gave a ground to a lot of people, and I speak from a personal point of view, because as a 16 going on 17-year-old, as a volunteer in the law centre, that opened, um, opened my eyes wider to issues that I was already aware of, but put them in a lot more context, you know what I mean? And and, and I was surrounded by elders who um, were, were challenging these issues, and I'd um, constructive ways in challenging these issues and so forth. So that, to me, that was a great ground and to, to learn about you know community, um, co about community activism and how to how to do things and maybe in some ways how not to do things. You know, but without not just the law centre, but without general organisations where you could go into and see black faces running them, employed in them, for the benefit of the black community. That type of um, could call role model structure it no longer exists so gradually that just eroded away any buttons that could be passed on to mm -hmm. any younger generations and made people become p complacent in the victories that were gained in maybe the 70s and 80s over certain things and and although i use the word victories that you know there's a lot more to go you know what i mean you can't put a number on them but after there's a hundred victories if you've only earned five then you know, it's, it's a very small percentage. So you've yeah. got a long way to go because when you're in a continuous battle against oppressive systems, these oppressive systems don't just go away because you win a victory. They decide to say, well, okay, you won that victory, but we're going to tighten up and be even more oppressive on other things that you haven't won yet. So yeah. the battle constantly increases and gets, it gets stronger. And if they can somehow destroy you by divide and rule, you know what I mean? Because that's an age-old philosophy of, of an oppressor divide and rule. And people are easily conquered. Then that makes their job a lot easier. Yeah. Especially when the people you're oppressing start oppressing themselves and pitting themselves against each other. You know what I mean? Which happens in a lot of communities and, you know, certainly happens in the black community as well. Yeah. So, you know, there's all these different things, but people need to be aware. You know, every single person can't be politicised, but for me, when you're born black, in an oppressive society, you're born political mm. by default, you know, whether wow. you want to or not. That's how I look at it. You're born into politics, so you have to either become aware or there's someone there to teach you that awareness. Yeah. yeah? Because, you know, everyone's not like me or like Lawrence J or yourself yeah. who go out there looking for these issues. You know, somebody has to teach you that. So yeah. Would that be somebody like us? Yeah. Yeah. But you certainly have to be have your eyes open so that you're aware of these challenges that are front of you. Because there's a lot of cases of, you know, there's certain people who can't see the wood for the trees type of thing. No, and I you, dig you. You know, and you need to be able to explain to them that is what you're looking for. Yeah. That is the problem in front of you. You know what I mean? And you need to be, be equipped and to challenge you. And to become more proactive, so with foresight. Because if you know and recognise you've got an oppressive system, you've got to be able to say, well, okay, if that's the case, then this is what to do. So how do we prepare to stop that rather than yeah. we see they're about to do something and then you wait till it's done and you try to react to it yeah. because you've got less chance of stopping it then. No, I got, I got you. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, with my American background, I mean, activism is, is, is played out for everyone, you know, from the Black Panthers to uh, the various different movements of uh, what we had to follow and what you probably followed yourselves, as you mentioned before, about how there were some inspirations of that that came over here. But um, we're also trying to open this conversation up in a, in a world kind of sense. And uh, with my brother, Jay, who always... Uh, lets people know that he's from uh, Bermuda and everything. Uh, <laughs> you know, what about activism? <laughs> what What about activism for you, brother? I mean, like in your in your growing up times and everything. What, what was the site that I, you saw? I've been having this discussion a lot in the last few weeks, where I've been saying to people, I was lucky to grow up in a country 
and I where I didn't know what it was like to be a minority until I was like about 19, 20 years old. I didn't know what that type of system was like. We we have a very colonial system in Bermuda. That's not saying that there isn't oppression from the same the same English white people that we're talking about here. It's the same families, it's the same the same money, the same things. Um, Bermuda has always been looked at as, as this paradise and, you know, I, I wish I would have remembered what this girl said uh, in Dera um, about places like the Caribbean specifically being called a paradise or a paradise lost and all of that sort of thing. However, um, as I said, I mean, activism in Bermuda came from the same the same places you know what i mean the the union started first that became a a political party and there were only two political parties in bermuda up until i don't know i think it was 1990 something or 1980 something it was it was a bit ridiculous but the 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 problem became the same problem it's the the so-called black party um now has more uh, more people fighting against it than for it. But it, but the question becomes, was it because the people within the party became complacent or is it because the people outside of the party couldn't, as you said, couldn't see the wood for the trees? You know, what's the, what's the balance? And, you know, Bermuda is a very strange place in the fact that, you know, we have no left-wing party. We have no socialist party. Um, we have a party that pretends to be socialist, but then on other um, human rights issues, they're very, very right wing, right wing, because they're supported by the church, which you know we we spoke about religion before, but you know it's a lot of the church mind state is black mind state in Bermuda. You know Bermuda has or had at one point the most churches on earth per square mile. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? We had the still the oldest still functioning Church of England church. On, in the Western Hemisphere, it, it's these these types of things. We're a very religious country, um, which goes against some of the things that Black people might be fighting for, which uh, which could be include religious freedom, which could include um, you know the freedom to be who you are, you know, as far as gender and all those other things are concerned. So our our other party, which started out as the United Bermuda Party, which never was united but let's not get into that um you know they were perceived as a white party but as i said as a as a bermudian that was born in 1975 i cannot remember a time where we didn't well okay we've had one where we didn't have a black premier Mm. which is the the person under the governor which is another thing and then now we have a black governor which is appointed by obviously appointed by the queen and everything but we have a lot of people who are like, oh, yeah, we have a black governor. It's all over now. And I think that's one of the things that uh, that, that as a, a, across the board, as far as activism is concerned, concern, we have so many people, and this is general, especially in the West, we're, we're very comfortable. You know what I mean? Everybody's got a TV. Everybody's got their phone. Everybody's got what they need. So it's like, well, why do I need to fight that guy over there? I don't, I don't need to now. But they're not seeing... The background of these of of the background motions that are going on, and so it's I think to get activism back to that state where you're talking about, you have to convince people that you think you're comfortable, but you're not comfortable. You know what I mean? And 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 show them the other side of things, but then that's where the problem comes because human nature is I'm comfortable, I don't care anymore. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's you know the same thing with the pandemic that was happening. You, you know, what happened when, when the shops reopened? You had long lines outside of Primark, long lines outside of Zara. But we had an opportunity while everything was closed to completely change the way society functions. But people were screaming about the status quo, yeah. you know? Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's so that kind of like brings this like kind of full circle in, in, in the sense where it's like uh, I would like to give – get your guys thoughts around um the black lives matter movement because in the in in our present time we are in a present time of crisis where change could be happening you know the change that it was always predicted the change is going to come and everything like that and we went into a full on change um societal change and um i always talk about america where at its most proudest had 50 states walking for black lives matter but as I knew, as most people knew, it's now, I don't know, five, seven, eight months later, and what happened? 
That's, you know what I mean? I exactly mean, like, it. I mean, so what do, what do you think, Lawrence? Well, first of all, I'm not a fan of protest as a way of creating solid, you know, real, you know, lasting change. Right. Protest has its place to highlight issues, but then it's the real work that goes on behind the protest that makes the change. You can go on marches, you can wave banners, you can shout and scream, but that doesn't change th- ev- people's everyday lives. It's about the organisation that you have to build behind protest. So in, in o- locations all over the world, if you're talking about Black Lives Matter, grassroots people have to get together, establish organisations that will affect change. And that affect change is not just done through letter writing, not just done through uh, direct action, you know, going and sitting on the doors of councils and saying, oh, you need to have better policies around housing, etc. It means that local people have to build. So that means sacrifice. It means spend your, your, your the, the wealth that you do have in your pocket to raise up organisations and individuals within those organisations who can then go and affect real change. It's about, in a, in a capitalist society like ours, it's about us making sure that black capitalism is harnessed for the benefit of the black community. Yeah, ideally capitalism is a, is a broken system, but when you live in a society that's based on those rules, we should be using those rules to better everybody's lives. You know, it's about saying to, to people like, like what um, Jay just mentioned about real change and, 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 and uh, real success is not measured by the phone that you have in your pocket or the card that's on the drive. Mm-hmm. It's whether your ch- children have the same opportunities to uh, aspire as other children do. And as long as we're going to poor schools and as long as we're doing worse than everybody else, as long as our life expectancy is so much lower, as long as our children don't have access to the same opportunities as others, then we're never going to do that. But again, that's not about going and either telling other people that they must do it for us or whether that's begging them or shouting at them. It's about us providing that for ourselves, you know? And, and, and well, me, how do we do that? Well, 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 okay, I've just given you a, it through sacrifice. So if that means instead of going on and, and spending £50 pounds to go and watch a football match every week, which is what some people do, black community, white community, you invest that within your community. Mm. Instead of saying that you're, you know, you're going to invest two hours down the pub every week, you invest it in doing something with our young people or, or with with, other, with black men like what we do right now. It's about that. It's about what you use your resources and what you devote those resources to. You know, right now I would suggest that, well, I, I, you know, I can say, I'll say openly, I would suggest that black people are not directing the lion's share of their resources into community development. And for me, until we do that, then the situation is not going to get better for everybody it might get better for individuals who take advantage of a situation, but if you're talking about things co- doing things collectively, then it's it's up to all of us being willing to do that. And, and I think that's that you said it the best. It's it's we're in a capitalist system, and the the problem that we have, I I see that we have is exactly that. It's that we we become very selfish, very insular, very me and mine, and you know. I remember the nineties. That was that was all anybody would say. It's like, yo, that's very American. It, it is, you know what I mean. That's was, yeah. That was that was what I remember hearing. It's like, oh, as long as me and mine are, are good, doesn't matter about anything else. And that's that's what I was saying about comfort. You know what I mean? It's you know, it's yeah, I'm comfortable. You know what I mean? But you know, my neighbor isn't. And and the question is, at what point do you worry about what your neighbor's got? over what you got i mean it's the same thing if you go back to parenting we go back to um how we raised our children back in the day i know that every single one of us here if we was out on the street doing doing something dumb anybody on the street could tell us why are you doing that dumb but now we have that situation where everybody's like don't talk to my children don't touch my kid don't tell me don't tell me how to raise my child leave the front gate mind your business exactly so it's like you know we're happy we have our little white picket fence to keep ourselves safe Mm -hmm. but the question is is that keeping us in or keeping us out you know what i mean just just Uh, to add on to that you know um to support your community is to support yourself mm. you know what i mean And, and that's how you look at it you know um if someone has a business, uh, if someone has a black business, if you su- you need to make it your business to support that business yeah. because that's how you challenge. That's the for us by us philosophy because as it's going to get reiterated several times. I've said it. Lawrence has backed it up. Jay's mentioned it. Is about we cannot expect the oppressor to take you out of oppression <laughs> because that's their job to oppress you. So just you can't expect them to take you out of that. You've got to do these things for yourself. And, and you know, them examples Lawrence gave you, you know, if people are spending X amount on, you know, going to the 
watch a football match maybe once or twice a month, then don't go as often. If you're spending two hours down the pub, spend half an hour or an hour, but invest that time and the money that it costs you to go there in mm. something else that's actually going to benefit your community. Just because by benefiting mm. your community, it's like what Malcolm said, nobody's free until everybody's free. You know what I mean? So, you know, it, it's a question of you can't say I'm all right and then there's something going on next door where there's poverty, where that poverty that someone's forced into could then decide, well, I need to take something of what you've got to survive. So you can't be comfortable knowing that there's that threat there. Yeah. To be comfortable, there is no threat. Yeah, so it's a... It's a confused state of mind that people feel they're comfortable simply because they've got a nice phone and a nice car and that, well, I'm all right, Jack, attitude, because that's that's why, why society's so messed up because there's so many people who just look to self. Yeah, and, but and too just, just touching on the, the one thing you said about, um, you know, if, if, so, if a black person opens a shop, it's your duty to make that your business. But it's also your duty as a black shop owner to, to promote that excellence. You know what I mean? Because we have an issue of some people who will open a shop and just because they're black, they expect people to come. And that's, I think we have a, a misnomer in that as well. It's like, you can't expect us to, we shouldn't be supporting mediocrity in the same way. You see what I mean? If you, if you open a shop and it's like, okay, everything in there is twice the price of anywhere else. If it's excellent, then people will come. You know what I mean? And I get that, that we should go and support them. But I'm, I'm of the thought, it's like, I'm going once or twice. And if, you're, if your business isn't doing what it's supposed to do, then I'm going to tell you your business is not doing what it's supposed to do, but I might not support you anymore in that, in that business. If you, you know, but then I think that's also an issue of, of activism in itself. We have a lot of face activists. I don't know how, how else to put it. Like, we have a lot of people who do a lot of talking and, like, we, what's the guy named uh, Umar Johnson? You know, we have people like him who, who give activism a bad name almost because we've seen so many people invest in things and then there was the in jamaica the, the other day the um the pastor who who insists that you give your sometimes your entire paycheck you know all these types of things so we've invested in these people only to be finding that these people have have robbed us so the question is is then i mean for the for the average layman for the side person who do i who do i trust it's like okay well I've seen that this guy was being supported by all these people and he was everything. And then we find out that, oh, he's been embezzling money and he's driving Lamborghinis and whatever. Well, the way, the way yeah. I look at it is this, is that we've got to be mature. Yeah. Economically mature. Nowadays, it's very easy now. There's practical ways you can manage those types of issues. There are problems for everyone. Mm. Do you know what I mean? There's yeah. the Orwellian thing that we have to deal with <laughs> yeah. within the black community, just like in every other community. Yeah. Once people might do well, they then forget why they were involved. So you have to keep your eye on the, the eyes on the prize, so to speak. But there's, me there's, there's mechanisms you can use to regulate that. You know, n nowadays it's easier than ever with everything being digital. You know, any time a penny is spent, you know, three or four people will get a notification that a penny has been spent. So there's ways we can get yeah. around that. What the, what the important thing is, is that you ensure that whatever organization you set up wants to achieve excellence. But at mm, first, yeah. it may mean, you know, no one, no black business that's set up in Liverpool oh, today, agree. for example, is going to be able to compete with Asda. Oh, I agree. So yeah, you, yeah. you're always going to have to charge more because Asda buys yeah, in bulk. And, and but if you know consciously that you might, might have to pay more to go to this shop, but you know where that money's staying in the community and isn't going to, to shareholders, you know, yeah, who, uh, who, 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 you know, might be in white South Africans for all we know. <laughs> exactly. Then at Thank least God. you know you're doing something. At least you know you're doing something for your community. And, and, and that's, the, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I agree with you completely in that. But, it's, but it's it takes time. Yeah, what, it, so, yeah. So you you you've got to be willing to build and be willing to trust each other. Yeah. It comes down to trust uh, initially. Well, and a, lot no of them, small a lot of people, shop can like with them a lot of people, stores. a lot of people. I'm not talking about even in the shops context. I'm talking about an, us organising. Yeah. A lot of black folks will not get together because we've taught not to, we don't trust each other. You call yeah. the divide and yeah. conquer earlier on. Yeah. And that's what what the first thing we've got to do is take a, a, a giant leap. A faith, faith and just say I'm going to trust it. I don't know you, Jay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know you, Chase, but I'm going to trust you because like, you, you're here. You're, you've automatically shown me you're willing to sacrifice some time to this. So of course, let's 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 sit down, let's break bread, and let's decide what we can do. 
to pass the baton on to the next generation with a little bit more. We yeah. know that the problems that we're facing are, are 400 years old, but we can pass the, we can make it a little bit better. Yeah. And that could be by starting up a black bank, yeah. a black credit union, uh, 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 you know, yeah. a black men's group that's going to teach our young black men something positive or give them some positive opportunity. Yeah. But it's, it's, yeah. it's all about sacrifice. And right now, I think that that is the key. Being oh. mature and how you address these issues, but being willing to sacrifice your time and your wealth in order to improve things, not just for yourself, because it starts with, um, you know, I don't think it should be charity. I know, like, like you said, Patrick, if, if, if someone's in poverty next door, that might have an impact on me or my kid because his kid wants the iPhone that my son's got. And, you know, yeah. as long, yeah. as, long yeah. as, exactly. as I'm all right, and he taxes yeah. him. Yeah. And then yeah. that causes all type of beef. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's I the, that, yeah. You know, yeah. that's the other thing that we don't think about is that you might think I'm all right, but if everyone else, if everyone else is barely in full, they're going to come and teeth, teeth what you what you're putting in your exactly, belly. Exactly, exactly. These are the types of issues that, like I say, seem very, very basic. But you got to address them first. We, we we address them, and then we can worry about. Well, my man's charging too much for X, Y, Z. No, I, I, I mean? this, but this is this is what I mean. It's it's only from my perspective in that sense. It's that, as I said, it's it's not saying that you shouldn't, you know, go to the new shop. It's saying that, you know, the shop's been there for a year. You know what I mean, and then the floor is still dirty. You know what I mean, and it's those basic things that some of our business owners are expecting us to support them, just because. You know what I mean, you know and what, that's. Do you know what I would suggest? That we set up cooperatives. Well, yeah, exactly. You know I mean? there, there's got, there's ways. 20, there's obviously if you've got twenty brothers who, who are all willing to invest yeah. in a business, and, and they'll say, "Yeah, no, I'll, I'll put yeah. in a thousand pounds. We can set this shop up, and then." I'll give six hours a week. So uh, that, that, that isn't necessarily paid, but it means that we can afford to pay someone to do the cleaning this, properly. Yeah, you know exactly. What I'm and I, 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 and this, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. It's it's just those things. It's, yeah, like, it's just a, But it, it all comes back to the other thing we're saying. It's like it's yeah. we live in a capitalist society and we've been taught <coughs> from, you know, if you was born anywhere after 1970, you were taught, you know, we were in the boom generation, you know what I mean? Where there was yeah. money flying around everywhere. So if you had money, you had money. You didn't have to worry about nobody else. But he, and especially in a place like Bermuda where yeah. we're from. So. But either way, I think that um, that was just a, a fantastic uh, suggestion. I mean, like, I mean, but you also have to be within the like-minded community to even think of making a suggestion of a cooperative, uh, which I think is, which is important um, to think about, like if you say for us, by us. But I just want to like, touch on as an as another important topic of this is is our young people because like uh the main thing that i've always been talking about on this show the various shows that i've been doing is about black excellence and about the importance of uh, black education which you mentioned like that that was going on in the center uh, where you guys were at at that time, Black History, Black Studies, uh, or forget like trying to put put the race onto it, but the idea of the importance that um, our history has so much um, given our generation or our future what it is, and we need to know more about the people that are lost. I read I read I read something on I don't think it was I think it was Instagram or something like that about uh, um, <clears throat> the guy who invented the potato chip. Happens yeah. to be a black guy, right? Um, but it was just like fascinating. Why do I have to find stories or, or or hear about this thing and be confused about it? Where our people. I shouldn't say our people, but black people in general is, 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 is so important to who we were. Why have we lost it? And in activism, how can we get it back? So I'm just going to put that to you, brothers, about like how important is our history? I know I'm going to have to start with you there because I know you know how important it is. So how important is our history to our young people, to our ourselves and to the future? Well, Ourselves meaning old people. When you say our history, black history, and like you said at the top of the show, you know, um, uh, black history is every, is well, every yeah, day. Yeah. Black history, you know, for me, and I always say this when I use the term black history, I use the term, but I don't agree with the term because black history is just world history. Yeah, yeah, I get you. It's black contributions to what's gone on in the world. That um, well, Thank you for clarifying. The That's black what I mean. History because the black contributions to world history are... Um, are, are for the large part, many of them contributions have been ignored, um, misappropriated, and even lied about, you know what I mean, in some cases. So it's not just important, it's clearly important for us because, you know, um, a, a tree needs to know it's got solid roots to be able to stand up, yeah? But also, <laughs> it's important for wider society yeah. because for 
the average white person who takes a supremacist view because of indoctrination from oppressive forces that um, which will teach them to oppress and, and belittle black people that they've got nothing, they've got no history, they're less intelligent, and, and base all this on some weird, you know, non-science, non-biology type of scenario, for them to be able to stop doing that, then they need to also learn these things. Yeah. Because once they learn and realise that, you know, every person, regardless of colour, creed or background, is capable of... of excelling in intelligence or not being intelligent and it's certainly not dictated by the color of the skin which which determines whether or not they're going to be intelligent it's determined by the surroundings by the environment everyone's a victim and i've said this many times when i've spoke to people if if one person has a child and denies them an education of any description reading writing just that basic stuff and that 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 youngster um has an offspring with somebody else who's, who's suffered in the same way, then and just what one generation, that's, that child has been dumbed down. And if you do that on a, a community-wide basis or society-wide basis, then that whole society, whole community, has been dumbed down overnight. Yeah, These things have been happening to the to the, the black people within Africa and the diaspora by European colonialist powers for hundreds of years. Yeah. So you can imagine that type of effect. You know, it's, it's it's a lot of work t- to undo it. But the great thing is, is there's people like us, and there's obviously many more people out there who recognise that these systems are in place that are doing this. Mm-hmm. So therefore, it, it gives you the ability to challenge that. To so stop how these important is it? Did, well, it's, uh, it's very important to actively push for more. Of this well, for all the reasons what I've just said, because by recognising it. And being able to challenge it, then that's how you stop it. So yeah. it's 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 you're, you're basically your life, your, your comfortableness, your future, your sanity. All these things depend on it. Yeah. So it uh, it can't get more important when your life, your sanity, your future, and all these things depend and on it. That that's how important and it as, is to, to as society as a whole. Because as you say, it affects everyone. If I'm okay and used to and not then that's going to impact on me in some yeah. way at some point. So I can't feel comfortable because every time I've got to walk through years, I'm thinking, well, whoo, whoo, whoo. Yeah, it's yeah. not comfort. Yeah? So yeah, like, right, like, yeah. like, um, like, I oh, see, I lost, lost where I was going to go, but it's, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's, it's the insulin nature of, 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 of who we are. I think it needs to change as well. So for me, it's, uh, it's educating everybody that I come across. So if it's, it doesn't matter what you look like, you know, it doesn't, I don't really care. It's like, this is, this is the way that my perspective is. I mean, I had a massive discussion with a guy who's an illustrator about the white gloves used in um, all them Looney Tunes and all those old commercials and the Mamie and all that, you know, but if I'm not willing as a person to even enter into discussions and this is where we go back to activism in itself. It's like, what, what do we define as activism? Is it, is it the marching? Is it the is it the, all the other things, or is it the little things that you do on yes. a daily basis? Okay. It's like you know, just having a chat, like having a talk with somebody who has a a, a a different perspective on life, and and letting them know that my perspective is valid. I'm letting you know that this is the information yeah. that I'm, and, and and that was the other issue with the discussions we had on Facebook the other day. People need to be willing to show their work. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like. This is what I believe. This is what the what the issues are. Here's some here's some information about that. There you go. You know what I mean. What we have at the moment is a lot of people screaming and shouting about things, but they don't want to show the background of it. And then when you when they are, when they do show the background of it, and you point out flaws in their background, they just go, uh, "Oh, we'll agree to disagree," which is <laughs> the most annoying statement on the planet. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> no, I don't agree with you. I just disagree with you. You know what I mean? It's it's not a, not no. about that. So, you know, as as specifically as black people, we have to remember, you know, teach. Uh, what was it? Each one teach one, right? So Ooh, yeah, yeah. So you you know you see a kid on the street and is is doing dumbness. Have a chat, and if his mom and brother want to come out and scream and shout at you then you know have a chat with them too we can't be afraid of, especially of our own people you know what i mean it's like if they want to come and fight me well you know let's have a chat first and then if you still want to fight me at the end well you know we can mm. I'll, I'll run fast it's all good you know what i mean it's <laughs> it's that it's it, but it's that sort of thing we're we've you, been we've been taught to be fight. so afraid of each other you know what i yeah. mean 
and you know especially of of uh you know how many of us walk down the street and see a group of black youths or any youths and hoodies and whatever and we're all like ooh i gotta cross the street now you know what i mean as as people we can't be afraid of those people you just walk right through them and so but you know I always say hi to everybody. Literally, everybody I pass is like, especially when I'm on the street on my own, mm. and especially when there's women around, so that I, they know that I'm there and all that sort of lovely stuff. But it's like, you know, just speak morning, afternoon, e- evening, all right, you know, all that type of stuff. Anyway, all right, sorry, Jay. I get, I get frustrated. So, 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 Lawrence, <laughs> I mean, you know, cap it all off. I mean, you have a well of knowledge, but if you could just, you know, break it down into a nugget, please. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give you a quote from the great Malcolm. I'm going to give you two quotes: Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael. History is best qualified to reward our research. And the job of the conscious is to make the unconscious conscious. Ooh. That, for me, is the key. Damn. So history is the best subject for showing what we've been and what we can be. It also gives you skills that are transferable. So what Brother Jay was talking about, about claim and evidence. If you're going to make a claim, it's a responsibility for you to provide the evidence to back up your claim. You can't just make crazy claims and then when someone says, oh, okay, well, where's your evidence for that so I can scrutinize it and then I'll adopt your point if the evidence bears fruit. We're not willing to do that. So it's teaching our young people those types of skills that can take them through life (laughs) rather than specialist skills that, you know, allow you to do one thing. And if you're not the best at that one thing, then you ain't got no job. You know, the types of things that we put lots and lots of effort and energy and resource in aren't necessarily the the things that are most... uh, uh, most beneficial to us and for me that's the key around history is it gives you those skills now how, how does it go into our activism well the history of black as- activism is probably the most inspirational part of our our story post-slavery so the way black people not only survived that but then went on to do great things in light of that history and the legacies of that it's t- inspirational to anyone it's it's the narrative for almost every uh, fable that we all uh, love to uh, to watch in fantasy mm-hmm. you know, yeah. overcoming great odds mm-hmm. you know the spartacus story for example oh, yeah you know you can transfer that to any point you can transfer it to the haitian revolution you know in mm-hmm. fact there's a book out called black spartacus talking about tucson lay overture yeah. we have those stories as part of our narrative yeah. and not with and, and i'm talking about the diaspora i'm talking talking about those who were unfortunate enough to experience whose ancestors were unfortunate enough to ex- to ex- uh, experience slavery there's nothing about that story that's shameful to me i think that that is the greatest story probably in the history of the last thousand years as web the bois said our ability to overcome those types of odds and then achieve the things that we have done mm-hmm. that is at the key that is a an, at the crux of what i consider to be the greatest you know acts of black activism that we've seen yeah, no. I mean, you know, amazing there. I know you want to say there's something there, Patrick, but I just want to just say is even just those words alone, I mean, can you imagine the feeling I get as an old man in my 50s, the feeling that I get every time I'm educated about something that has been washed away or forgotten or not even told me is 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 powerful and i could just imagine what that feeling would be for a young person who was already feeling less than because of what they're taught about slavery and about slavery members all of that other kind of stuff if they are given just these nuggets of what you just said today do you know what i mean would would be powerful if this was in a book that that they're told to respect do you know that's all i'm just i i just can't say how important it is for people who watch this to really get behind if you have the ability to get behind the various different colleges that are in schools that are in your own neighborhoods to just enforce the idea that and i i'm not calling it like black history pat i'm i I agree with you that it's world history but i'm just kind of saying that's what the cap they put onto it we need to get this discussion back into the schools to the young people so that way they grow and feel more positive about themselves yeah well they do because i i, I remember just i remember explaining this to someone the other day i had that my little um growing black history exhibition on in in, in a local center the granby center the other day and i was t- talking to a woman and i said you know one of the best moments i had when i had this exhibition was a few years ago in the fire pit i had it on I was a little Somali girl, she must have been about nine or ten years old. As she was looking through it, she noticed there was one or two people from Somali history who were on there, and a woman in particular. I uh, seen her eyes light up when she looked at her, and then she just run off, you know what I mean? And then two minutes later, she'd come back and she had two or three friends in tow. Yeah. And was pointing, saying, that she's from my country, that's where yeah. my mom's from. <laughs> and, and that made me feel so good that, I can imagine. you know, that inspired her to see that. 
You know what I mean? And mm. that's what, you know, encapsulates everything what Lawrence has just mentioned about the power of history, you know what I mean? And, and to be able to, you know, tell that story and, that, and equip people with that positiveness, that desire to want to know more and learn more and aspire to be things which the people who don't want you to progress are constantly telling you you can't progress to the point oh. where you end up telling yourself it and they don't even have to do and the job. They're d- you're doing the job for them. That's how great they and are. It, you it know, yeah. I think that's the other, the other part of it is that we have to acknowledge that none of us know all. You know what I mean? You have to be... You have to be open to being wrong. You have to op- be open to being educated at all points. You know what I mean? It's even if you've got a doctorate and whatever, there's always somebody who can who can teach you something. And that's I think one of the other things that we as as a world, as a as a entire humanity, have have started to lose. It's I'm right, you're wrong, and that's it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And 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 you know we can't we can't continue to to grow at all if everybody's right because it's everybody can't be right. It? People stand up on too much pride and all. Pride is foolish. But they say pride before the fall. So you know people have to lose that pride and be, uh, be a lot more humble. Yeah, I mean to be able to accept. Chase, can I just interject to one point learn. that you made that I think is really important? So what you're talking about about challenging the colleges and the educational uh, institutions is absolutely key. But we also need to use that ethos that I mentioned earlier on about doing for self. Why is it that there's more? I know of more black people who've set up after schools football clubs than after school educational clubs. What's going to be better in the long run for our young people throughout their lifetime? What's going to be more beneficial to them? The one person who might make it, you know, who makes it into football, or the hundreds who will benefit from getting a more solid grounding in the history of black people, both in this country and elsewhere. I think that's key. I think we've got to start saying. You know, it's not just up to these t- schools coming back to the oppressor, which is part of the system, that miseducate our children, that set them up for a factory lifestyle, you know, the nine to five run. And when that jobs, those jobs don't even exist anymore, we're, post in, we're a post-industrial nation. We don't give our kids the, the spiritual nourishment that they need and the intellectual nourishment that they need to grow into strong black people. That's for me is the key. We must start to provide that. You know, part of the Liverpool Black Men's Group is hopefully we'll be, we, will, we will do some type of provision for our young people to educate them into the history, to educate them in the importance of the activism within their own community, which is a great history. It's an, just an addition to the stories of Malcolm and Stokely and Toussaint and all those greats who've come before us. It's something that we've really got to start saying, listen, and, 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 and it's not just for other people to tell our kids that. And the other thing mm. we need to do is we don't write our own history academically, you go into any history department of people <laughs> who are working on black history or African history in this country anyway, you don't see any black people. You know, what's mm. the African problem? As long as the, the uh, hunters have the historians, you know, his stories of the hunt will... Oh, sorry, got it wrong. Until the lions have their historians, stories of the hunt will always favour the hunter. We don't write our history. You know, it's other people. You go to white people to read about black people's history, you know. But uh, just just a quick point on that. There's no reason to can't be both. That's the other thing that we have to look at. It's like, yeah, they're setting up all these football academies or whatever else, but there's no reason that within playing football, there isn't something else going on. You know what I mean? We we can't be singular with our with our thinking. We're not in a in a society where we can just be one thing anymore. Yeah, but it's yeah. priorities. Yeah, it, but it's it's, no, it's it's like any, it's it's like anything. You worry about the things that mm-hmm. are the, the but you have to necessity. But then, first. and if you look at Asian no, uh, people, for example, yeah, no, the, I. I Asians, they disproportionately are doctors, aren't they? Or, or, or medics, or, yeah, or, yeah. or in this country, or pharmacists. Are you tell me there's no great black, uh, great Asian footballers? But for whatever reason, their people are telling their young people, uh, this is the route that you go down. I, I'm insisting I, I'm that not, you do I'm it, not whether the, you're great at art or football or but whatever. That's what, but that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying... you've got to prioritise. But I'm not yeah, saying... But the thing is that as a, as, as a group of people, we, we favour educa- uh, ed- entertainment. You know what I mean? So it's a question of... It like like uh you know KRS One had that album Edutainment. There's no reason it can't be both. You know what I mean? It is, bro. Because uh, entertainers, do, can't, you can't base a, com- a, a, no. a society on ed- entertainers. No, uh, entertainers are always the. I'm not saying entertainers. I'm saying entertainment. So if you're if you're going to a football um, academy, there's no reason why you can't do two hours of football and an hour of math afterwards. You see what I'm saying? That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. You already have the focus because they're there anyway. So there's no reason why we can't say you're doing football, 
but you're going to do this too. But, but my only problem is is that we focus too no, much I, I agree. on There's those things. Because we on, think on it's the one. unrealistic. Because we think it's the only one way. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? And that's no, that's no. that's so what no, we have no to get back to. No one's saying close the football clubs, but let's get our priorities straight. And, as, and, and as I said, it's we like... We shouldn't be giving our kids unrealistic goals so that when they fail... You feel like they, they, they Well, they I'll, I'll give you examples. Lifetime lasts till his early thirties, and but yeah. what what I'm saying, what I'm trying to, years, what I'm trying yeah. to say yeah. is, yeah. is that we're not. Yeah. It's not that we 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 expect every foot every child in a football academy. What I'm saying is, is that as the people who are setting up a football camp, you have to have a more holistic view of the community you're setting that up in. You have to look at it as, okay, I'm going to provide these guys with little football training, but I know that half of them are hungry. So I need to make sure that as well as getting a little football training, have a little run around, having a good time, that they're fed as well. You know what I mean? So we can, we can feed minds, we can feed you know bodies, and we can play football. It's, it's it's what I'm saying. You, you use no, one I to draw them in, saying, use one to draw them in, and that. give them all the other stuff it, it, just... Yeah. Just so that they don't, because yeah. as I said, with young people, the problem I find with young people is that they don't like being talked at. You know what I mean? And a lot of our, a lot of our people do a lot of talking at people, and that's I think a problem as well. We need to start talking to people and to our, especially to our young children, our young people, because I, I, I feel, and this is me looking at our, our this, the younger generations, like my son's generation and and below, they really don't care <laughs> you know what i mean it's it's a really strange thing it's not saying that they don't care but it's like as a as a generation that literally has every piece of information on earth at their fingertips they can look around and say well why should i listen to you the reason that the world's in the place it is is because of your generation so why should i listen to anything you have to say the only way the only way you can come at them is try and get them engaged somehow and then talk to them and and explain those things like the history we need to give them all those types of things so for me you know i my son really likes like uh, musical theater and all that stuff so i i point him in a direction and say okay well check out that character why is that character like that you know ex- explain to him that this is the, the the writer of this has no experience of black people so this is the characters he creates so the, the thing is that you need to be able to learn how to write so that you can then write write properly for us, you know what I mean. So it's as I said, it's just there's no reason that it has to be education or entertainment. There can be, there is an avenue for both. You know what I mean. Yeah, there is an avenue for both, but it is still about priority. You know? Yeah. Because even though I understand the analogy of it, you know if, if some of the kids are homeless or hungry, feed them. But if if you prioritized and said, well, okay, we'll put the football on a back burner and the resources that you're using for that, you would then feed more children. And then once more of the bellies are full, you'll be more physically able to do well, the football. Well, there's a reason why and you go to school to get an education and not to play football. Do well, you know what I mean? That's, that's, that, that's the key. Is It's not about saying, and it's, you're absolutely right, it's not an either or. But that, it's about yeah. acknowledging that you need certain skills yeah, I, in order to become responsible members of community. That, and that's the and thing. Within entertainment, it's a great it's a great goal to go for, you know. But, uh, uh, but uh, entertainers are only ever in the tiny minority but, within any but society. But that's, that's what I'm saying. It's not no, You're it's not a, providing... A, a, I know more black f- pro- professional footballers than I know black doctors. Why? And, and for me, mm-hmm. I know mm-hmm. it's the other th- it's the other way I around for me. You're in B- 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 exactly. But, 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 but I'm but, talking about within, with, within a country where, it's, where you, you've got, you know... We, where you're in the minority, that should not be the situation I, that I, you're in. No. I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with that. that. that what is, I'm that saying is, is that you you already have these these types of things set up. So the question is, why is this guy who's doing this football thing, try, like it's it's like we have to be realistic with our children from di- from jump. So it's like okay, we're having this football academy. Fair enough. However, we know as as we look back in history and time and everything that probably one of you if any, is going to make it past this academy. So as well as doing this academy, you're going to do this, but we're also going to do this, this, and this. You know what I mean? And as, as the people who are setting up those football academies, as I said, have a holistic view of the community that you're trying to set up in. Because it, it doesn't make but sense. It but it, that's and that's the So yeah, the question yeah, is, I so, mean, so for me, it's like, it's, it's for people like us to go to those football academies and say, hey, we know you're doing that, Give us 30 minutes of their time to give them something else. You know what I mean? So that's what I'm saying. It's like 
it's all of us need to go in yeah. all in. You know what I mean? It's like, okay. Right. You know, yeah. So so you're there, all right, but your <laughs> brothers are on the same side looking like you're having an argument. But well, you both are agreement yes. is that education is indeed important. Yeah. And that's what I was just really just kind of trying to cap it at was is that I totally agree with Lawrence where it's like since the 60s or 50s in America, we just followed footballers like Jim Brown and Fred Williamson and we just followed sports like, you know, um, you know, all of the other days, Jim Brown and Fred sure, Williamson. But, <laughs> but when I, when you, it, that became an importance. It became about raising your kid to be sporty or athletic. Yep. It became about all of that and then not focusing on his mind. When the Black Panthers came in, they were focusing on your mind. Exactly. They were saying all these long words for you to have to go and look into it encyclopedia to figure out what the brother yeah. was saying but that was powerful it was sexy it was it was it was what we needed but we've lost it and that's what i was just trying to say and trying to get to the end of these conversations about activism is bring it back that's all i'm trying to say <laughs> is education is important Amen. you know yeah, what i mean it takes people have got to build that's the, that's what i'd like to finish on saying is you've got to make a commitment to build means getting out of, un, from under that tv or from you know going to football match and that, get uncomfortable a time yeah and, exactly and, 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 and build exactly and like you're saying is that there's been too much focus on education and entertainment but it's like it's still there it's going to be there we're just trying to raise it so like as you finally got to your point is is that let's provide that education you know we're doing that as a liverpool black men's group we're trying to do different things but that is the main thing we're trying to support our young people a cooperative banking scenario of support or education we're talking about going into you know Tassif and Granby to offer you know more like talks and lectures and everything else like that just get behind us man that's what we're all about yeah, you know but either way this was cool heated in a hot room, but cool. Yeah, he did because <laughs> it was a hot room. I, just, I, I, I can't leave without talking about Teo, but I'll let Patrick talk about him. But go ahead, hit, hit me up with no, that last thing. I was going to say to you, one of the things we can do is support each other's initiatives. A lot of brothers are doing really positive work out there, and they don't get support from our community. So, you know, you, I can see Patrick's holding the, uh, the, 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 the leaflet for Brother Teo's next play, please. Yeah. Well, we've got we've got a, a guy um, who is a member of Liverpool Black Men's Group, but aside from that, he's a great actor, great performer, great singer, and he's got a play on on the twenty seventh of November, um, which is not far away. It's a Saturday, and it's called Just the Ordinary Lawyer. I've had the privilege of seeing this play um, over a year ago, and I can say without a shadow of a doubt, it's brilliant. It's a one man performance, and Although it's only one man, there's several characters within that performance, and it is powerful. So people definitely need to see it. Um, as well as he's got, you know, his famous call me Mr. Robeson, which mm -hmm. I'll be making it my business to see because I've always yeah. missed it when it's in Liverpool. But I'll be there this year. So check out Liverpool Black Men's Group Instagram, Facebook, website, and you'll find more information about how you can get tickets for this play. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, and everything. And so you know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask for something very short <laughs> for our brothers to just say, be able to say uh, what they, their final thoughts on activism in the future. So I'll start with you, Lawrence. We come from a great tradition of activism in Liverpool, and we must re reinvigorate that today. Thank you, Lawrence. Jay, uh, we need to go to the people where they are as well. So, you know, sometimes it might take going in the house. And sitting on their couch with them. So let's go ahead and do that. Patrick? Well, basically, it's just a matter of if you want to better yourself, you're going to gonna get out of it what you put into it. And it's, it's that simple. So the more you put in, the more you're going to get. So people need to put a lot into it and better than themselves. Yeah. It's good for everybody. And we have to be the water that, blo uh, that causes that flower to blossom and grow. You know what I'm saying? Ooh. And I mean, that's what we're... <laughs> hey, look, bro. Totally. <laughs> and, uh, you messed up my ending. You know what you look at. it. <laughs> this has been an enjoyable conversation. And trust me, it may seem heated, but it's passion. These brothers are about passion, and, and, and so are you. So hopefully you'll join us in the next conversation here on the Liverpool Black Men's Group. And uh, I'd like to thank my brothers once again. But until then, we out of here. All right. Nice one, cool. guys. Yeah.